Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a special lecture. Today, we are very honored to invite the Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine, Professor Wendy Shackman, to today's lecture. Now, the Vice President of Academia Seneca, Dr. Zhang Renqian, will deliver the welcome remarks. Let's welcome VB Chen. Professor uh, Randy Shackman, um, dear academicians here, and ladies and gentlemen, it is really my pleasure and honor to say a few words to welcome uh, Professor Randy Shackman. Uh, Randy was here uh, two years ago in uh, year two, 2013. He also gave a talk here, and at that time, I introduced him and said that there's, uh, the one who received this uh, NASCAR award in uh, basic medical research is the one, is a very good candidate for Nobel Prize. And maybe I'm a good prophet. So uh, in year 2013, uh, Randy uh, received a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And um, Professor Randy Shackman is a professor at the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology, UC Berkeley, and also an investigator of Howard Hughes Medical Institute. As a graduate student, he studied the enzymology of DNA replication with Dr. Arthur Comper at Stanford University. And his current interest in cellular membrane was cultivated during a postdoctoral period uh, with Dr. S.J. Singer at the UC San, San Diego and at Berkeley. Um, Professor Shekman developed a genetic and biochemical approach to the study of eukaryotic and membrane traffic. And as I mentioned that um, uh, Professor Shekman received uh, many, many awards, uh, including this, um, uh, the Gardner uh, International Award, the Upper Alaska Award for uh, medical, basic medical research, and the Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology or Medicine in year 2013 in which he shared this award with um, Dr. James Rossman and Thomas Judeho. And Professor Jackman is a member of National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Science, and American Physiolo a Philosophical Society. And he is also a foreign associate of, uh, this is very difficult to pronounce, this uh, Academia Nationale de Lindsay and the Royal Society in London. And also in uh, 2014, we are very honored and, and with great pleasure to elect an, uh, a Professor Shekman as our uh, honorary academician in our Academia Sinica. And Dr. Uh, Shekman uh, also uh, elected, he was elected as the president of the American Society for Cell Biology and in year 2002, he was appointed the editor-in-chief of the annual review of cell and development biology, and more importantly, from uh, year 2006 to uh, 2011, he served as editor-in-chief of PNAS. Uh, a lot of our audience here have paper published there in PNAS. But, and he was appointed the editor-in-chief of an open access journal eLife, as mentioned here, and sponsored by the HHMI and Wellcome Trust and the Max Planck Society. And eLife become a very uh, important uh, journal. So today, we are very great to have chance, this chance to invite um, Professor Shekman to give a special lecture for us. That's what I <laughs> Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Taiwan again uh, after just a two-year uh, absence to see old friends and meet new, new make new acquaintances, especially on this auspicious occasion. So thank you very much, Professor Chen. Um, what I'm going to do this afternoon is to uh, return to a topic that I discussed two years ago having to do with the mechanism of collagen secretion. We've made a little progress that I want to share with you. Uh, then I'm going to change topics completely to discuss a brand new project in the lab that was developed 
by a brilliant graduate student. Uh, it has to do with how mammalian cells, indeed many metazoan cells, secrete vesicles. They secrete vesicles that have special membrane proteins, and interestingly to us and to many others, they secrete vesicles that have small RNAs, microRNAs. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the most part for today's lecture. And then, of course, at the very end, I'll give a brief uh, summary of where we stand with the journal eLife. So let's begin. Um, last time uh, I was here, but probably many of you were not here, so let me just review it for you. I talked about an interesting problem, one that has been of concern to us for some years, and that is how the normal process of protein secretion can be adapted to the secretion of very large protein complexes. Now, the machinery that we discovered that's responsible for secretion, uh, originally with genetic work in yeast, uh, relates to most proteins that are secreted, but some are very large and cannot be housed within the normal small transport vesicles that, that eukaryotic cells make. One of the pathways for traffic involves a coat protein complex called COP2. Here are COP2 vesicles. These happen to be COP2 vesicles from yeast. We discovered the genes and the proteins that cooperate to form this complex. They consist of a series of cytoplasmic proteins that come together and polymerize under the surface of the ER. And as they gather together, they capture membrane and secretory cargo molecules into a patch, which is then pinched from the membrane by a scaffold protein complex consisting of a heterotetramer of two SEC gene products called SEC13 and SEC31. This process is universally conserved in all eukaryotic cells. But in mammalian cells, indeed in other even lower um, metazoans, some proteins, like collagen, are much larger than can be accommodated by a 70 nanometer vesicle. Collagen, as it assembles in the ER, forms a rigid triple helical rod uh, that exceeds 300 nanometers in diameter. So the question that we posed many years ago was how could this complex be packaged? And there are other examples. Lipoproteins uh, are larger than a normal COP2 vesicle. One extreme example is in uh, the intestine, and pterocytes that line the intestine manufacture and secrete giant lipoproteins called chylomicrons that can grow to be as large as a half a micron in diameter. So clearly, if that mechanism employs the same machinery, there must be some way to adapt that machinery to the size or unusual shape. Well, the first crucial thing is to demonstrate that the normal pathway is involved in the secretion of collagen, and this we by chance uh, stumbled on an observation that convinced us that it is. And this comes from the analysis of a disease that came to our attention through a clinician at Johns Hopkins who was with a Saudi colleague stu st studying a Bedouin family from Saudi Arabia that had a rare craniofacial disorder with a mutation in one of the inner subunits of the COP2 coat. In patients with this disease, we found, as you'll see in this slide, that, that there's a, a rather pronounced defect in the secretion of collagen. So here's one experiment that suggested this. The top panels are of normal fibroblasts spread out to look at the, uh, the leading edge. In this case, stained with an antibody against a luminal protein, protein disulfide isomerase, but also with an antibody against a form of procollagen that shows a coincident overlapping signal. Clearly, these are transit forms en route out of the ER. In fibroblast skin cells harvested from one of the children afflicted with this disease, the, although the cells grow reasonably normally in cell culture, the ER tubules are highly vacuolated, as seen here by their inclusion of this luminal ER marker, but also by the uh, accumulation of procollagen which, once again, overlaps with the luminal marker. So this was one of several quite independent pieces of evidence that collagen, in spite of its size, must use the same mechanism for protein secretion. So we struggled with this problem, how to understand this, until a colleague of mine 
a young colleague by the name of Michel Rapa, who studies printing ubiquitilation. And a graduate student of his, Ling Yan Jin, found just by chance that a particular subunit of a what's called E3 ligase, in this case, a Cullen E3 ligase, uh, is responsible for some aspect of the growth of the extracellular matrix in mouse embryonic stem cells. And they found that this ubiquitin ligase tends to act on the subunit of the outer coat of the COP2 uh, complex. This uh, subunit is SEC13. They also found, as you'll see in the next slide, that when they overexpress this one adapter subunit in uh, normal uh, fibroblasts or in uh, cultured cells, HeLa cells, for instance, the cells accumulate giant COP2 structures. Here's a piece of evidence. Oh, actually, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. I always forget that. So here is um, a stain in the top panel uh, of this particular ubiquitin ligase subunit showing uh, very large ring-like structures, much larger uh, than normal COP2 vesicles. And this, would be, this is interesting because there is a coincidence uh, in staining of different subunits of COP2, the two outer layer subunits and one of the inner layer subunits. And when the signal is uh, um, merged, they clearly are coincident. Now, uh, as we puzzled over these observations, it became clear when I visited the campus of Vanderbilt University that others had this problem in mind as well. And to return to this slide, I found on the Vanderbilt campus a quite unusual sculpture where the artist also was pondering how a large polyhedral stu structure such as this could envelop a rigid rod such as procollagen. And if we never figure this out, we'll go to the artist and see what she has in mind. <laughs> All right, well, so when we saw these giant structures uh, through the efforts of Lian and Micha, uh, we, I immediately thought uh, that this may be the mechanism uh, to allow large particles and collagen to be packaged. And so Kanika Bajaj, a postdoc in the lab, joined forces with Lingyan to do a simple experiment where a cell line, another fibroblast cell line that is prolific in the secretion of collagen, was transiently transfected with this subunit, the gene that encodes this subunit, to see if overexpressing that subunit under conditions where giant COP2 structures form would uh, ease the secretion of collagen from these cells. So here's uh, that simple experiment, which we published a couple of years ago now. So here's uh, uh, an experiment where cells have accumulated a lot of procollagen. It is allowed to be secreted uh, in a uh, brief 30-minute incubation in cells that are either overexpressing this ubiquitin ligase subunit, uh, a control vector, or a mutant copy of KLHL12 where the mutation blocks the ubiquitilation of SEC31. And in just a brief period of time when this protein is overexpressed, one already sees procollagen in the growth medium, whereas in a control incubation, little if any is detected in the growth medium. Likewise, in a control where the, a mutant protein is expressed, very little. So um, we uh, published these results, and, uh, but were challenged uh, by one limitation in our analysis at the time, which was we hadn't actually demonstrated that collagen was contained within these giant COP2 structures. There seemed to be a correlation, but the antibody that we used against collagen seemed not to detect pro-collagen all that readily in these structures, even though we knew it was in the cells. And so then uh, another terrific graduate student joined the lab, Amita Gorur, who surveyed various antibodies against procollagen and found a commercial monoclonal antibody that recognizes a folded uh, peptide domain uh, at the very C terminus of procollagen that was uh, more sensitive in detecting intracellular transit forms. And so now let me tell you about those new experiments that persuade us uh, that the, the structures that we observe really do carry procollagen. So here is an experiment with this new antibody. And maybe if we can have the lights down, it'll be a little more dramatic. Uh, is that possible to have the lights down? 
Well, you could close your eyes and the lights would go on. <laughs> <laughs> and you wouldn't see the picture. So I, I think it's this whole. So this is the cell line that we used in, a, uh, last, in the last slide that uh, has an abu- ah, thank you, that has an abundant accumulation of procollagen. And uh, one can see lots of, uh, this is not a cell that's overexpressing the ubiquitin sub- ligase subunit. It's just a normal cell line. And so now one can see lots of uh, smaller pumpi uh, marked by their content of SEC31. One can also see that some of these pumpi uh, are labeled with the monoclonal antibody against procollagen. And in uh, this overlay, it's clear that now at least a subset of the SEC31 complexes do carry procollagen. So that gave us some confidence to look more carefully at this. And to do this, we cons- we've constructed a new cell line into which we've introduced, by stable transfection, a copy of the gene for procollagen 1. And we've also introduced, under a regulated promoter, the gene for KLHL12, the ubiquitin ligase subunit. Here is uh, here's some information on this cell line. It's a uh, human fibrosarcoma cell line. Normally, the cells, these cells do not express procollagen. There's no label. Uh, but now, when we've introduced the procollagen 1 gene, one sees a lot of material within the cells that uh, largely uh, is delayed in the ER because there's so much of it. And in fact, by immunogold staining, we can see procollagen within the lumen of the ER in this cell. The cell also has a regulated copy of KLHL12. And after induction with doxycycline for just seven and a half hours, one already sees uh, structures labeled with KLHL12 that are two to 500 nanometers in diameter. After 24 hours of induction, these structures grow to sometimes several microns in diameter. So we can now regulate the growth of these structures by regulated expression. So let me show you a few images uh, from these cells after induction for just seven and a half hours that show uh, a more regular co-localization of COP2, procollagen, and KLHL12. Here is one such image. This is a double immunofluorescence image where uh, procollagen is uh, labeled um, with one fluorophore. This is a um, uh, immune, indirect immunofluorescence. Procollagen is labeled with one fluorophore and calyx with another. And there are large pumpy where the two uh, coincide. We can also extend this, and here I think if the lights can be off, this would help. Um, we can extend this to triple uh, immunofluorescent uh, localization and show pumpy labeled with an antibody against KLHL12. Uh, an, a- an antibody against SEC31, and then this monoclonal antibody against procollagen. And here, uh, in the alignment, there are clearly large pumpy that have all three labels. We've taken this a step further by collaborating with a, a chemist at Berkeley, Kai Ju, who's constructed a new a super resolution microscope that allows uh, three dimensional images to be taken in a Z stack. So here is uh, one such image, uh, not yet processed, but where uh, the two (coughs) labels, one for KLHL12 and the other for SEC31, align. And here's another image, a Z-stack through one of these clusters, where in false color, one can see depth to the structure, and where, as you'll see in a moment, one appears to see a hollow center to the COP2 cage. one can clearly see that these structures in the super resolution image have a a, a hollow center surrounded by subunits of the coat. In double immunofluorescence super resolution imaging, we can in fact see procollagen in the hollow interior of these structures. So this is good progress. And let me tell you about two other things we're doing now. And if I can have the lights back up, Um, we're, we're looking by electron microscopy to visualize the coat more precisely uh, on the surface of the membrane. But uh, even more importantly for me, we've very recently been able to recapitulate 
in a cell-free system, the formation of large COP2 vesicles that capture procollagen in vitro. And we are in, uh, in, able, in these conditions, to add recombinant KLHL12 to the cell-free reaction and stimulate the packaging of procollagen. So this now gives us the kind of freedom that we want to explore the mechanism of this process to see exactly how ubiquitination can be coordinated to the formation of this larger structure. So maybe next time in, I'm in the academia, I'll, I'll have those results for you. All right, let me turn for the rest of my talk to a subject that I'm greatly excited about for several reasons. And that is, as I introduced at the outset, how cells manufacture vesicles for export. Now cells, all cells, man manufacture proteins for export, but many metazoans, and certainly mammals, make vesicles inside the cell and ship them outside of the cell. Tumor cell lines are prolific in the production of these vesicles. They're called exosomes. And very often people have characterized these, but not done a, a thorough job in their analysis. If you take a tumor cell line and you centrifuge out the cells, you take the conditioned medium, if you centrifuge that medium at high speed, you find a collection of a variety of sizes of vesicles of probably of different origins, some of which carry uh, certain membrane proteins, but also which carry uh, small RNAs, enriched in microRNA. So the question is, how do these structures form in the cell, and how do they capture their carbo content, particularly their, their RNA molecules? So here is a simple cartoon depiction of, a, of an exosome. They're typically very small, maybe 70, 80 nanometers in diameter. There are obviously some bilayer membrane. There are sort of integral membrane proteins. I'll describe one in particular that's found quite uniformly in many preparations. They also enclose some cytoplasmic proteins. HSP70 is found in the interior. Uh, but our, our attention will be focused on how they acquire RNA molecules. Now, what's known about the biogenesis of these structures can be summarized on this slide. But they appear, at least in part, to use a pathway that is known for the degradation of cell surface receptors that are internalized when the cell no longer needs them. So when a cell is uh, incubated, when a, when a, a beta adrenergic receptor uh, is uh, titrated with a ligand, it's often, the receptor is often internalized into the cell be, by becoming phosphorylated and then ubiquitolated. It's internalized from the cell surface where it then is delivered to an endosome. And at the endosome, ubiquitolated membrane proteins are further internalized by invagination into the interior of the endosome, ultimately to produce a, an organelle that's referred to as the multivesicular body. Now, most often, these structures fuse with the lysosome, where the content of the MVB is degraded and the amino acids are restored to the cytoplasm. Sometimes, for reasons that are not under, at all understood, uh, a subset of these multivesicular bodies is delivered by fusion to the cell surface, where vesicles are discharged uh, and then um, can possibly be delivered to a target tissue. There's a lot of interest in this uh, because of the idea that exosomes may mediate a more complex process of intercellular uh, communication. Instead of being a simple hormonal lig ligand, these structures may convey multiple membrane proteins and even microRNAs to control gene expression. Indeed, there is evidence in the literature that tumors may produce, may exploit this pathway to secrete exosomes and microRNAs that travel to a target tissue to create what is referred to as a pre-metastatic niche uh, that would permit metastasis from a primary tumor to a secondary site. Now, there is some descriptive evidence to support this, but there's no proof, and there is no evidence that microRNAs have anything to do with this. So there's a, this is a field that is rich with opportunity, and I became very excited when Matt Shirtless, a graduate student, joined the lab and was interested in pursuing this question. 
Now, in surveying the literature, uh, I felt that it was necessary to purify a particular exosome species because this, the traditional means of their identification involved just a simple high-speed centrifugation. And if you look at the material in a high-speed pellet, it's quite uh, dispersed. There are many different species. So we felt it would be important to have a way of purifying an individual species. And we chose a cell line, HEC-293 cells, not transformed, but just the normal cell line that we had in the lab, and decided to look at that material secreted by the cell, see if we could identify a unique exosome species. And to do this, we chose one membrane protein called CD63, a four-spanning membrane protein that has been demonstrated in the literature to be a major constituent of exosomes. Matt devised a procedure to purify these exosomes based on their content of CD63. So here's the uh, flow chart of his purification. He started, as uh, others do, with conditioned medium, but he used a series of lower speed sedimentations to uh, remove large membranes, and then collected small membranes that sediment at 100,000 times G. But even then, we imagine this material was still impure. Matt found that he could then sediment these uh, vesicles to equilibrium uh, such that the CD63 immunoreactive species equilibrated between 20 and 40 percent sucrose, whereas other membranes in the fraction sedimented elsewhere. But even then, we thought perhaps there'd be uh, some further purification necessary. And so we used an antibody, a polyclonal antibody, against the predicted uh, loop facing the outside of the exosome, uh, specific for CD63, and we immobilized CD63-containing vesicles on beads, and then eluded them with the peptide against which the antibody was raised. And that became a fraction that we thought was fairly pure. We also then devised a new uh, simple way of quantifying the purification. Uh, uh, we attached to the C-terminus of CD63 the enzyme, the, the firefly enzyme, luciferase, which is a really very potent enzyme and very sensitive and, and one that's easily quantified. And we could see a <coughs> progressive increase in the specific activity of luciferase during the different steps of this fractionation. We also showed that these vesicles collected by um, the antibody uh, contain RNA, whereas vesicles um, in a control incubation with a control IgG, uh, there, there was no retention uh, on CD63 antibody, uh, no retention on these control beads. So there's RNA in these vesicles, and it clearly coincides with the CD63 protein. Now, um, there's a simple way of proving that CD63 uh, and luciferase has the expected topology, and that's a, a, to perform what's referred to as a, as a latency assay, and that will become important for, for a point that I wish to make in a moment. So let me show you a very simple experiment. We predict, based on the known topology of CD63, that the luciferase fused to its C-terminus would be in the lumen uh, of the vesicle, and therefore it should be inaccessible to the membrane impermeable substrates of this enzyme, luciferin and ATP. Indeed, if you incubate intact vesicles with substrates, there's very little luciferase activity, but it becomes very clear uh, on addition of detergent to expose the luciferase moiety. And importantly, we were able to show that this luciferase is very sensitive to proteolysis. Trypsin degrades this and eliminates the activity. So this confirmed, in a simple biochemical assay, the predicted topology. Now, um, we then, with this purified material, were able to ask an important question. What are the microRNAs that are contained in this species? Are there unique species? What fraction of them that the, cell, the cells make ends up in these vesicles? So we got quite a surprise. So in a deep seq RNA analysis of, of about a thousand different species. Most of them are in the cells or both in the cells and exosomes, but a small subset of them are found uh, almost entirely, exclusively, in the exosomes. Indeed, this one, MIR-223, about which I'll have more to say now, 
is about a thousandfold enriched in the exosome. And that implies that there's a very active RNA sorting event that allows that RNA and a few others to be captured for some deliberate purpose. Now, what is that purpose? It may be that uh, MIR-223 is delivered from these human embryonic kidney cells to some target tissue to control gene expression in that target. Indeed, with MIR-223, there's a literature on what that uh, RNA may do. It seems to be involved in cholesterol homeostasis, controlling genes involved in cholesterol biosynthesis. Of course, the other possibility is that this is simply a way that the cell has of quickly getting rid of MIR-223. Maybe it just wants to get rid of it, and this is a quick way to do it. We can't distinguish those two possibilities just yet. But what, what we can say is that there's a very, very active RNA sorting event going on, and so we wanted to try to understand that at a, at a molecular level. How does, how does RNA get captured by this process? And, and if, if we could figure it out, maybe that would have something to do to explain why microRNAs uh, are delivered in exosomes to, to, uh, to other tissues. So for this, uh, as we always do, we turn to a biochemical approach, and Matt devised a cell-free reaction that reproduces the formation of exosomes with isolated membranes and concentrated cytosolic protein. So let me tell you about the first such assay that he devised that, that gave us some encouragement to measure microRNA sorting. Oh, actually, let me, this is some further characterization, so let me go back. So in, in examining uh, the purification, the standard purification that I already told you about, uh, but now focusing on two of the most highly enriched microRNAs, MIR-223 and MIR-144, it's clear that these also are enriched during the course of this fractionation. So they, like total RNA, clearly are contained within the CD63 vesicles, and we can show that this, these RNAs are really inside the vesicle by using the same kind of latency assay that I described a moment ago. But instead of using trypsin, we use ribonuclease. Both RNAs are resistant to ribonuclease unless the incubation is conducted in the presence of detergent. So these two species are in the CD63 vesicle, but inside the vesicle. OK, now, how to, how to study this by using a cell-free reaction. Here's the idea for the first assay that Matt and I uh, devised. Now imagine that CD63, uh, that um, uh, HEC293 cells are manufacturing these exosomes, and suddenly the cells are ruptured by a physical disruption. At that moment, at the zero time, one predicts that there'll be some exosomes that have already finished budding into the interior of the endosome, and that the luciferase contained within these vesicles will be sequestered within not only the membrane of the exosome, but also the membrane of the endosome. And therefore, these molecules will not be accessible to the substrates ATP and luciferin. On the other hand, there'll be luciferase bound to CD63 already uh, still on the surface of the endosome, which would be accessible to substrates, and there may even be some molecules that are caught in the act of being incorporated into a, a bud into the interior uh, of the endosome. And so we imagine that if this were so, that on addition of substrates, some may be captured, bound to luciferase, or simply be enclosed in the uh, solute and would be conveyed into the interior of the endosome in vitro during an incubation at 30 degrees for 20 or 30 minutes. These vesicles would have substrates and would continue to act on these substrates for some time after being enclosed within the endosome. All right, so how to measure that? Well, uh, what well, was actually pretty simple. Uh, so we conducted this incubation. And then centrifuge the membranes to wash away uh, substrates. And then treat, importantly, treat the endosome with trypsin under conditions where luciferase would be, that remain on the surface of the endosome, would be degraded and would not have access to its substrates. And that the only vesicles, the only material 
that would retain substrates and continue to produce photons, which is the product of the action of luciferase, would be those that had been formed during the 20 minute incubation at 30 degrees. So it sounds like a lot, but it was actually reduced to a very simple enzymatic assay. So it worked. All right, what are you telling me this? Here is one of the results of the first experiment. So there probably only a tiny fraction of the luciferase is enclosed during the 20 minutes, but the enzyme is a very potent enzyme, easily detected. And so we saw a signal. We set that to 100% just to compare it, uh, and found that a parallel incubation without cytosol, but with just membranes, produced much less latent luciferase. An incubation conducted in the presence of detergent, even less. Or a control incubation held on ice produced a very low level. So a cytosol, membrane, and temperature-dependent formation of latent luciferase. This gave us some comfort that we may able, be able to measure the formation of these vesicles in this crude reaction. Now, the important test then was to see whether the conditions that we had established would reproduce the capture, the, the RNA selective capture of microRNAs. And here's the basis of that assay. It's a simple assay, just as I've described. We do the same incubation, but now add chemically synthetic MIR-223 RNA and uh, ATP. And then instead of adding trypsin, we add ribonuclease to degrade RNA that hasn't been incorporated during the incubation. And amplet then dissolve the membranes and detergent amplify and, and quantify the RNA uh, that has been protected during this incubation. Once again, it worked. Here is the result of two of the first experiments. Um, the signal produced at 30 degrees with membranes and cytosol, surprisingly, uh, enclosed 7% of the chemically synthetic microRNA. We know this was exogenous microRNA uh, because the endogenous level of that microRNA in the cells is, so, is very low. And we added in the in vitro reaction a thousand fold chemical excess over what we calculated was in the cells. And yet, we still see 7%, which is quite striking. And this was meaningful because a control incubation on ice incorporated much less. An incubation without cytosol incorporated virtually nothing. And an incubation without membranes was simply background. Even in the presence, uh, even an incubation, a full incubation, but one conducted in the presence of detergent, did not produce any protected RNA. That was encouraging. And also, biosynthetic reactions like this typically require ATP, hydrolyzable ATP. This reaction also uh, was a just a little over twofold stimulated by ATP. Here's an incubation without ATP, uh, with an enzyme that hydrolyzes ATP, or with a non-hydrolyzable analog. Still above background compared to the four degree incubation. So this was also encouraging, but the real test is, is this specific? Can we measure MIR-223 capture uh, in contrast to a cytosolic microRNA that we did not find in the exosomes. So to do this, Matt repeated this experiment, comparing MIR-223 with another microRNA called MIR-190, one that happened to be made by these cells, but which we didn't find in exosomes. And sure enough, as you'll see here, there is striking selectivity in the packaging. In this experiment, Matt's getting a little better. We're now up to about 9% efficient incorporation of exogenous MIR-223 in a temperature-dependent reaction. Whereas the control cytoplasmic microRNA is very, only very inefficiently incorporated at 30 degrees compared to the 4 degree background. If you examine the kinetics of this reaction using time points, the rate of MIR-223 protection um, mirrors the rate of forming formation of latent luciferase activity. Whereas the rate, the low rate, the background rate of incorporation of MIR-190 mirrors the low rate of luciferase protection in an incubation on ice. So we believe this is a meaningful and distinct signal. Now, um, of course, 
this is a complicated reaction. There are many proteins that are required. And we begin to figure out what, what some of the cytoplasmic proteins are that are, are responsible for MIR-223 capture. To do this, Matt did a clever experiment where he used, in the standard incubation, a derivative of MIR-223, one that has a biotin group that would allow one to uh, recover this RNA after an incubation and to see which proteins adhere to it uh, during the uh, formation of exosome. So the same incubation as before, all the way through, including ribonuclease treatment, but finally, after detergent addition, the material that is retained on the biotinylated MIR-223 is recovered on streptavidin beads and then evaluated by mass spec. In the analysis, there were several RNA binding proteins, some quite abundant. But one that stood out was one that had already been reported in the literature to be secreted in vesicles by cells, an RNA binding protein called the YB1 or YBX1 protein. Here's a paper from several years ago that described this paper. It's known to act intracellularly in various RNA transactions, but was also reported in this paper to be secreted by cells in a form that is protected against protease unless uh, detergent is added, just what we would have expected. And that protein stood out in our analysis. Half of the peptides, half of the protein was, re was uh, identified in peptides in our mass spec analysis. Fortunately, there's a reasonable polyclonal uh, commercial antibody against YBX1. So Matt repeated the same experiment as before, but evaluated the incorporation of that protein, YBX1 protein, into vesicles during the um, in vitro reaction. Here is the outcome of that experiment. These experiments contain the biotinylated microRNA, and in a full incubation at 30 degrees with membranes and cytosol, on uh, addition of ribonuclease after the completion of the incubation, one sees uh, YBX1 protein that's uh, retained. These membranes are centrifuged, treated with ribonuclease, and then dissolved in detergent. The recovery of detectable YBX1 protein is greatly enhanced in an incubation that contains cytosol, obviously, because that's where the protein is. It's a cytosolic protein. But it also is greatly enhanced by having membranes. So if there are no membranes, YBX1 protein um, is uh, not protected uh, in, in sedimented along with membranes. Uh, if the incubation is conducted on ice, uh, a very low signal, uh, or if the biotinylated microRNA is not added, then of course also a very low signal. So this protein binds to the microRNA, to particularly the MIR-223, perhaps others. Uh, it accompanies that microRNA into vesicles that form in the reaction. Uh, but but does, it, it, does it play an important role in this process? Is it required for the capture of MIR-223, both in our in vitro reaction and in cells that make exosomes? So in the last two experiments, uh, Matt did first an analysis of cytosol prepared from cells from which the YBX1 gene was, uh, 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 was in, in which the YBX1 gene was mutated. And to do this, of course, we've used the CRISPR-Cas9 technique developed by my colleague Jennifer Doudna. And uh, we're able to show in a homozygous YBX1 null that immunoreactive protein is no, no longer detected. This, uh, the gene was not actually not deleted in this null. Uh, in fact, it was just a frame shift mutation. But that's enough to eliminate the production of the protein. So we made cytosol from this YBX1 null and compared it to wild-type cytosol in the biogenesis assay to measure the formation of latent luciferase or in the microRNA packaging assay both assays, as you'll see in the next slide. So let's look at the left. If you compare wild-type cytosol with YBX1 null cytosol in an incubation at 30 degrees, the, the luciferase signal is the same, higher than the background seen in an incubation conducted at 4 degrees or an incubation without cytosol. So YBX1 is not required, we believe, to make these vesicles. But as you'll see on the right, it appears to be required 
for the capture of MIR-223. Two control cytosols were made uh, from cells that, that retain the YBX1 gene, and both now, uh, in this case, we're getting better yet, about 11% of the MIR-223 is captured, um, with a much lower recovery of MIR-223 in an incubation containing cytosol from the YBX1 null. Matt uh, recreated a cell starting with the null by introducing a, a, by stable transfection an additional copy of YBX1. And cytosol made from that cell now restores the packaging, uh, but not, perhaps not fully, in, in the negative con uh, minus cytosol control shows a, a background labeling, uh, background packaging. All right now in the final experiment, the real test is, is uh, is YBX1 protein required for the capture of MIR-223 in the vesicles made by intact <coughs> HEC-293 cells? And so um, we did an analysis and found uh, that it's a little more complicated than uh, what I just showed you. So let me show, show you my two last slides, what we found. It turns out that uh, there are two paralogs of the YBX1, YBX2 and 3, neither of which are expressed in most cells, uh, certainly not in, in HEC-293 cells. But as you see in the next slide, when you delete YBX1 gene, or when you render it null, the YBX2 gene now is upregulated quite dramatically. And that may produce a protein that can partially replace the YBX1. So let's just look at that data. This is now um, just looking at RNA produced from wild type or YBX1 null. In the YBX1 null cell, the mutant gene still makes message. It's even more highly uh, uh, expressed, but the protein is not there. However, quite interestingly, the YBX2 gene, which is normally completely dormant in 293 cells, becomes quite active when the YBX1 gene is, is uh, rendered mute. So uh, we thought this would be a complication. Indeed, as you see in the last slide, it was, but we, we have a resolution. So here's a, the result of a, several experiments. If you look at exosomes produced by cultured 293 cells, there is a small but not absolute reduction in the content of MIR-223. However, in YBX1 null cells, if the YBX2 gene is ablated by siRNA, uh, a further reduction in the capture of MIR-223 is detected. So that now there is a perhaps three or four, fourfold difference in the efficiency of capture of MIR-223 when both copies that are expressed are, uh, are eliminated. So that's the data. Let me um, summarize it, and, and then we can speculate and tell you what, what direction we're taking this in. So uh, we, we believe that uh, MIR-223 is in the cytoplasm, and they have functions in the nucleus of the cell that's expressing it. They have cytoplasmic functions. Uh, it will bind uh, an RNA binding protein, in this case YBX1, and this RNA, RNP may be recognized by part of the machinery necessary for the formation of these invaginations uh, that form vesicles in the interior of a multivesicular body, and they may, in so doing, include RNPs some of which may be exported outside of the cell. Now, it's equally plausible that this whole process occurs at the cell surface by a budding event, similar to the formation of enveloped RNA viruses. And at this point, we really can't say whether these come from MVDs or from the plasma membrane, but, but we have a way of testing that. Well, there are many, many questions that to, to, to ask, and, and some of you may ask them, but let me re remind you this. So far, is the effort of one fourth-year graduate student, so there's still a lot to, to be done. We'd like to know if there's a signal on MIR-223 that is recognized by YBX1, and that is perhaps shared by other microRNAs that are packaged by this. Matt is doing an experiment to test that. He's uh, made exosomes from cells from the YBX1 null and from wild-type cells, and he's just completed a deep seek. RNA analysis or uh, sequencing, and now he's evaluating the data to see which microRNAs are dependent uh, on YBX1. And he's doing other experiments to see if he can identify uh, 
a signal and possibly a structure that's necessary for this capture. There are other questions about whether there are other vesicles that these cells produce that have other RNA binding proteins and other carbon molecules. And we have um, a tumor cell line now that we're growing up to see if they make uh, exosomes by this by the same process that we can study using the biochemical uh, uh, reconstitution that, that uh, Matt implies. Many, many things to do. Well, let me uh, share with you then the people who've done the work that I described to you today. Uh, hiding in the back here is Kanika Bajaj, who collaborated with the Rapa Lab to evaluate collagen secretion. Uh, Amita Garur, talented graduate student, now in the lab, who's studying the co-localization of collagen in these giant COP2 structures. And uh, Matt uh, Shirtliff, a fourth year student, who's done all of our exosome and microRNA analysis. Now, since I have just a few minutes, um, and I'm always on a mission to sell this journal, let me just tell you just briefly where we stand. Last time I gave you critical remarks about the competition, but now I'm just going to give you positive remarks about where we stand with Eli. So here's the journal. I think many of you, perhaps most of you, have heard about it. It was initiated just two and a half years ago with funding from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Wellcome Trust, and the Max Planck Society. We've recruited a, a great group of editors from around the world who make all the decisions. All the decisions are made by active scientists. And uh, we have generous funding from these organizations, so the journal is not only open access, but it's uh, free uh, for submission. There are no, there are no fees, and no page charges. Um, we are not in the business of selling magazines. My business plan is to lose a lot of money, and I'm doing very well with that. <laughs> um, in the two and a half years uh, since we opened for non-business, um, we've published 800 papers. We are on track to uh, receive 400 submissions this month, and my computer awaits with lots of decisions to be made. And we estimate that we'll probably have 5,000 submissions this year, which is really quite uh, quite daunting since I have to approve all the final decisions. So here's, uh, here's uh, the data for the last year plus uh, on submissions. This is already out of date. There are a couple of new data points up here. that shows no signs of trailing off. Um, here we are in publishing volume for last year. We've already uh, surpassed PLOS biology, cell, and science, at least in terms of life science publications, and we're rapidly uh, closing in on Nature Cell Reports. Nature Communications is, uh, publishes a lot more, but we're, um, our goal is to publish all of the great papers that we receive. We won't impose any artificial limit. We're not looking to be exclusively restrictive. We, we, uh, wanna, we wanna encourage people to send us their best work and to treat it fairly and openly, and then to publish it. Well, I'm often asked, how will I assess whether the journal has been a success since I don't believe in using impact factor to evaluate success. Indeed, I don't really believe in using citation analysis because there are some subjects that are inherently more popular than others and ge therefore generate many more citations. In fact, I can tell you that uh, some of the most important papers are rarely cited at all. I'll give you one example. Uh, last year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given for the creation of, of the microscopes that achieved super resolution. One of the inventors of the procedure, Eric Betzig, uh, published a, a paper in an optics journal some uh, 10 or 15 years ago that described the theory that he eventually was able to use to develop a, a palm microscopy. That paper, even since he's won his Nobel Prize, in, in the history of that paper, has only been cited 100 times. And you know, it was clearly a revolutionary paper. And that, that is true of all the literature that, that, that is uh, profoundly important. The problem with impact factor is it assesses the influence of a paper only after only the first two years of its publication. Anyway, there are many other problems, and I, and I promised I wouldn't, wouldn't complain about it. <laughs> so so what, how do we assess our work? How do we know that we're, we're, we're succeeding? Well, one measure is. If I am successful in getting the members of my editorial board to send us their best papers, and many of them do, not all of them, but many of them do, and we, we have some committed authors who are on the editorial board, and of course, 
or have not. Another way that I've thought of doing it is to have a look at the institutions that are successful in sending us their papers. And so I issued this as a challenge in my last slide. Here are the top 10. This is a top 10 list. We're now into the national basketball championships <laughs> and the college at, at, um, at, uh, in, the, in the US. And uh, so we're always looking at the top. Here are the top 10. I'm proud to say that I've been very influential to my own colleagues at Berkeley. <laughs> They're number one. Uh, importantly, well ahead of Stanford, very proud to say. The second institution is a fine institution, UT Southwestern. You, I think you'll recognize all of these as prominent institutions. And the next time I come back here, I want to see Academia Sinica on this list. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Professor Sandman. Now uh, the lecture is open for our uh, discussion. Any question or? Yes. I can Use the microphone. The identity of the topic of the three is known. Um, it, it may be known to others. Uh, uh, all, all I know is um, uh, there is a literature on uh, its uh, control of genes like HMG core duplicates. Uh, the, the exact target probably is known, but I, 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 I have to read those pages myself. I was just worried about this a few weeks ago. And do you think they explain the gear structure or the sequence of the mRNA being recognized yeah. by um, yeah. It's hard to imagine that a 20 tumor has much structure, um, but maybe it forms a structure in complex with, uh, with the RNA binding protein. Um, uh, we looked at the 56 microRNAs that are highly enriched in our exosome preparation. And they don't share any obvious uh, linear sequence homology, maybe two nucleotides. That may be all that's necessary. So we don't have an answer yet. But here's an experiment that Matt conceived of that, I, that I'm really excited about. Um, he's using a variation on the Selex selection procedure to identify RNA sequences that are captured in our in vitro reaction. So in this, what he's done is he's made a random pool of 20 tumors, and he's taken them through one, two, three, and four cycles of our in vitro reaction, taken samples, and is now doing sequence analysis to see if he can find refined sequences that pass uh, at each stage. And that will help us, I think, pinpoint whether it's a <laughs> primary sequence or uh, some kind of a structure. And then, of course, you can take these RNAs that have been sorted and see whether they are enriched in their ability to bind to YBX1 protein. But again, just one graduate student so far. Yeah, Brandy, a quick question related to the eLife. I noticed uh, the journal, or you have been actually using this chance to build up a community. Yeah. It's almost like a social media type of thing yeah. related to science. Yeah. Now, this is going way beyond a journal now. Yeah. So where yeah. is this going? Well, so, uh, thank, thanks, Brian. So, um, the one, one element of that community building is the way we review papers. I think I described this last time, but let me repeat it. So when a paper comes in to eLife, uh, it's judged by one of our scientific editors, uh, one of the senior editors. We have 20 from around the world. And uh, that person decides whether the paper in his or her area of expertise is really there's some important discovery. If it's judged to be of potential interest, the paper is then given over to uh, a member of our large board of editors. We now have over 200 members of the re reviewing editors. And that person appoints usually two other ad hoc referees. At that point, it's similar to other journals. But then, after each person finishes the, the review, the reviews are posted online at the manuscript website for the other referees to see. And at that point, the reviewers are uh, identified to each other. And they are asked to uh, chat online about their reviews and about the paper. And so it's actually interesting. and I. I'm able to see all these conversations develop. Um, uh, it's very interesting that you see sometimes go on, these conversations go on for days, back and forth, between the referees who are experts and who know each other, uh, you know, discussing the paper and, dis and discussing uh, their own remarks and trying to come to some decision. Um, once that's done, the board member who's 
asked to serve as a referee and to supervise the process, uh, writes a single letter, usually, a single decision letter, when the decision is going to be favorable. Uh, and then the referees uh, agree or not with the language. And that letter is sent to the uh, author. And in a favorable decision, the author is then asked to respond. It goes back to the board member who is asked to make a decision on the spot. So the community building that happens is the referees, and this is quite unusual, in the at least in the literature, the referees are in conversation with each other about a, about a paper. And so we found that a lot of people really enjoy this. And, um, and they feel that they have some, that they're empowered. They have some role in the decision. It's not something they just hand over to the editor. They actually have a role in it. So we've had some very enthusiastic reviewers who, who then uh, asked to join the board. So that's one aspect of the community building part of it. But there are other things that we're, we're doing to foster that. Among the three major codes themselves, Cup one, cup two, and class three. Now you show us cup two can change its size immensely, and then class three to a certain extent. And the one in between cup one, I, I don't know anything about yeah. it, but there, sternal maturation seems to be the favorite. Yeah. Uh, can, uh, can you comment on this? Are yeah. there really multiple mechanisms for all three stages, or really each stage requires different yeah. mechanisms? Yeah. Good question. Uh, I'm not aware of any evidence that COP1 can change its shape to form larger structures. And in the cisternal maturation model that you mentioned, there would be no reason to do so. Because the, there, that, the, the role of COP1 is in retrieval and not a big thing, it's just a standard cargo molecule. But I should tell you that, um, that Jim Rothman, uh, who proposed a, a different view many years ago, still favors his view that COP1 vesicles are also involved in anthrograde transport through the Golgi, and he has a couple of papers in eLife that describe that, the role for COP1 in the, in the packaging of very large uh, aggregates of food that progress through, through the Golgi. So there may be some way to adjust the size of the COP1 vesicle as well. Um, whether this constitutes a completely different mechanism, I think it's just a variation on a, on a common theme rather than a completely different mechanism. But there probably are other coats uh, that are elsewhere, and we've been working on that for packaging of protein that trans uh, So, yeah. Uh, what determines uh, KLHL12 to go to the particular assembly site yeah. uh, of the ER? Uh, does uh, pocology yeah. send some kind of signal? Yeah. Well, uh, I can speculate. Nivek um, Nolotra, discovered a, an ER membrane protein, a, a, a type 1 membrane protein, that is required for collagen packaging in the COP2 vesicles in cells. And uh, one idea would be that uh, when collagen binds to uh, Tangle 1 is the name of his protein, it may, in the lumen, it may <coughs> mobilize uh, the ubiquitin ligase in the cytoplasm to come to the site where the coat may uh, begin to polymerize. That's just speculation. Maybe angle one or something bound to it. Um, no, no, evidence. no evidence. But you can see, even in a wild type cell, even without overexpressing KLHL12, you can see that protein, the endogenous protein, on COP2 vesicles. But not everyone. Yeah, not everyone. Yeah. Yes. What would be the possible function for package microRNA in any thought? Um, yeah, well, so I, I mentioned two. One is that that's just a way a cell has to getting rid of them. Uh, but, if, you know, they could be delivered to the lysosome. That would be another way of getting rid of them. I, I hope it's something more positive, but I can't say. And, and the, so the alternative that most people favor is that uh, the microRNA is being delivered to a target tissue to change the pattern of gene expression in that target. Um, but I should, I should caution that no one has evidence for that idea. I mean, it's out there in the literature. It's an attractive idea, but there's no evidence for it. And so in fact, there's some skepticism that a small vesicle could possibly carry enough microRNA to affect gene expression in the target, unless that target were invaded by multiple vesicles being 
return one. Is there any indication that both type of R will be packaged? Well, I've given you the, the evidence there's some very specific packaging, at least in this one circumstance, and there are some other publications now that show that there's some specificity, but most of them haven't seen this kind of selectivity, but I think it's because they haven't purified, no, no one has really reported a purified uh, exosome vesicle species. So if you're looking at a crude mixture, the enrichment may not look as, as, as striking as what we found. Recent study, uh, recent study showed that uh, MAPR can uh, can. Uh, your microphone is not on. <laughs> Push it. There it is. It's on now. Okay. Recent study showed that uh, some MAPR can produce some regulatory uh, peptides. And uh, have you found this uh, uh, regulatory peptide in your body? Yeah. No, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, we haven't looked. We haven't asked that question. Um, uh, again, let me let me mention. No one has shown that uh, microRNA in an exosome uh, is even delivered and detected in a target cell. <laughs> so it, it may be, it may end up expressing a peptide, but no one's shown. So the only experiments that have been done to show that these exosomes can be taken up by a target cell have been where vesicles have been made fluorescent. And then you can see the fluorescent puncti in target cells. But, but, but that result that doesn't say anything about whether the in interior content of the vesicle was, this, was expelled into the, into the target cell. So there's a lot to do, that which I think makes this such an interesting field. There's so much to do, so little to do. A question back there. Um, I don't know whether the exosome uh, uh, delivered the uh, entire uh, AGO2 or uh, yeah. microRNA P complex, yeah. or the the microRNA just uh, 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 was was uh, is delivered by itself and uh, to yeah. the recipient cells and the reassemble into the uh, yeah. AGO complex. Yeah, I, there is a report of uh, Argonaut in exosomes. We have not looked ourselves in in the ones that we that we make, and we're only just now we've just completed a more extensive RNA analysis to look at. The, the full range of RNAs. There are some reports of messenger RNAs in these vesicles, but t typically they're very small. Uh, and there is one report of Argonaut, um, but that's not our work. Yes? Uh, it's a phenotype of YBX1 knockout. Uh, OK, see, that's a good question. So in our no, there was no, f no, uh, no effect on cell growth or uh, even the, you know, they make exosomes. They, they, so there's nothing that we could see that was wrong with them. Now, others have reported a role for the YBX1 protein. For instance, it seems to bind to dengue virus RNA and may have a role in gene expression of dengue virus. That would be an intr intracellular um, role. So it may have other, other roles, but we've seen, all, well, you've seen everything that, I've, that, that, we, that we know so far. Okay, is there any other question or comment? Okay, if not, let us um, uh, thank uh, Professor Schickman again for his uh, very uh, intriguing uh, talk. And, and also, thank you very much for your uh, participation in this um, special lecture. So, I'm um, uh, last to conclude uh, this um, uh, outstanding lecture. And thank you very much.